mind 90 year old crack rolling over Oreo. 90 year old crack? Yeah. Rolling over Oreo. Yeah. What? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh. Do you understand that? Yes, I do. Okay, because I don't. I just write down the things and hope that you remember our conversation. <laughs> could could you read that back? Yeah. I, well, I think this should be the preamble of the episode now. Okay. How I understand what this means. 90-year-old crack rolling over Oreo. So, uh, <laughs> welcome everyone. This is Hello. an episode of I Love This You Should Do. My name is Indy Randall. With me is my lovely co-host, Samantha Randall. Hello. So this was from when we were going to sleep and I have like, <laughs> I have ideas and yeah. we write them yeah. down and we'll say like, oh, we'll talk about them on the podcast. And I'm usually like half asleep writing them down. So they don't always make sense. And then if this is your first episode, usually the first four minutes of this podcast, <laughs> we talk about nonsense and then we get down to business. Yes. So 90 year old crack rolling over Oreo means when I'm like 90, mm-hmm. I feel like might as well try crack. Okay, yeah. Crack maybe might not be my one. But like the illicit drugs. Yeah, maybe I'll like do hard drugs because what do I got to lose? Yeah, because like those are the ones that they're always like, don't do them because you'll die or you'll be addicted. Yeah, and if I'm close to death, if I am terminal with cancer or something, right? Yeah, maybe might as well do heroin. Right. You know, at that point, why not? Yeah. I would have to look into because I actually don't really know what crack is like and all about. Right. And it might not be something I'm interested in. But uh, just drugs in general, I think I would do them at that point because right. why not? I feel like a lot of drugs have like a counterbalance too. Like, How do you mean? Like, uh, I don't know. Cocaine is one that I know that is like an upper, I sure. guess. Yeah. So then you do cocaine and then you do something to like bring you down again so that you can sleep, but not so that you're sober. Oh. So it's how, like, that's kind of how I understand drugs. I don't know which drugs are which. I just know that cocaine is like a stimulant. Yeah. And there's other ones that are like downers that bring you down so that you can like... Depressants. I only like depressants because I'm too up. Yeah. I'm also too depressed, but oddly enough, depressants bring the depression down. Yeah. So you're like, um, cannabis and alcohol are depressants. Right. They mellow you out, man. Mm-hmm. Like, although some people get all wild, you know. Oh, true. Yeah. But uh, anyways, that was about <laughs> when I'm near death, I feel like I might as well do a bunch of drugs because mm-hmm. it doesn't matter then. Uh, the rolling over Oreo, <laughs> that means like the other level of uh, just letting myself go is I would keep Oreos just on my bedside table. Oh, you like roll over in the middle of the night. In the middle of the night, I was like, you know what? I want an Oreo. Or like a bite of chocolate. I am 99 years old. I've been given two months to live. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just going to eat Oreos in the middle and I'm not going to brush my teeth. That's that's (laughs) my like wildest dream. Yeah. If you know about Indy, he has a very strict oral hygiene routine. And just eating. I'm very healthy. very, very, Very healthy. So I would never do anything like just eat an Oreo because I want one. That seems like that's the, that's my dream. It's true. So to me, just going out and shooting up Sweet Lady H <laughs> and eating as many Oreos as I want are on the same level of both things that I will never do until I am sure that I am near death. Yeah. Okay. How about you? You have no problem just eating Oreos whenever you want. But... No, I should eat fewer Oreos. <laughs> Yeah, but you could argue the world should eat from your yes, Oreos. But yeah. would you do drugs when you are elderly? I think so. I would, like you said, I need to do some research on like what drugs do what things. Um, like the idea of cocaine and it being like a stimulant, you being able to do a bunch of things in the like Wall Street bro kind of way. Um, seems interesting to me, but like as a person who can't blow their nose, sucking a powder up into my nose seems impossible. And if this is your first time on the podcast, (laughs) also Sam can't blow her nose. Not that she can't, she won't. She refuses to. You you won't do it. You it's not that you can't, you won't. It's very different. I can't. You can't try. I've tried. You have not. I've been there when you have tried. And if I were to do the same thing that you just did in your biggest attempt, I also wouldn't be able to blow my nose because that's not how nose blowing works. Okay. You have to blow air through your nose to blow your nose. I do. You don't. Yeah. You go like this. (laughs) 
No. <laughs> okay. That's not what we were talking about. <laughs> also, this podcast was supposed to be about John Wick. Oh, right. But to summarize, hallucinogens, that's where I would go. That's where you'd go? LSD, acid, MDMA. Like, I'll, I would do all that if I were 95. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds fun. I'd just spend my last days in a psilocybin haze. Oh, see, that seems nice. It could be. could be terrifying. What about Who knows? opium? What about opium? Would I? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Okay. If I'm, if I am like terminal, yeah, I'll do opium. I bet I'll that s- would make you feel a lot nicer than being terminal with cancer. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's why people love like morphine and stuff. But I want to smoke opium like out of a big long pipe. Oh, like like your like in eighteen hundreds yeah, China. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I'm going to go to an opium den. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm like get you the were full opium relaxed experience. on a cushion in an opium den. Oh yeah, one of those big velvet yeah. cushions with the tassels. Yeah, I'm going to buy one of those cushions. Yeah. I'm going to buy a big long Gandalf pipe, and we'll set you up. I don't even know like what the form of opium is when you smoke it. Like what is the actual thing i don't know but these are things i have many years to look up yes you have many many years to learn how to do opium all right everyone <laughs> this has become a, a pro drug podcast now <laughs> <laughs> you know that that should be our advice to our young listeners because they're like hey these guys say do all the drugs you want i say wait until you're when you're death yeah then live you can your do all life, the drugs be you productive yeah and then you don't have to be productive well do you- be as productive as you be want nice. to be. Be nice. Be nice. I don't think anyone needs to be productive. I think everyone needs to be nice. Okay. Stop yeah. being productive, actually. <laughs> be nice. Yeah. And then your reward when you're old and riddled with cancer <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> is that you get to try all of those crazy party drugs. Uh, I think we've said some things that we're going to want to walk back at some point, <laughs> but I think we should just uh, power through. And okay. Um, okay. hey, Sam, what's this podcast all about? Oh, uh, we are talking about John Wick today. Uh, so if you're new to the podcast every week, uh, we cover a movie of uh, one of our choices. and Or every other week. Or every other week. <laughs> every other week, actually. <laughs> okay. Uh, so every other week, uh, one of us picks a movie, and then the next week we discuss it after watching it. So we are in the discussing after watching portion of our schedule, and uh, we are talking about the 2014 Keanu Reeves movie, John Wick. And this was your pick, yes. but not one that you had watched and loved in and I should too, as the title would no. indicate, but rather, why'd you pick this one? Uh, because for some reason, I hadn't seen it, and I love Keanu Reeves. Sometimes I go the route of, I really should have seen this already, and you're going to watch it too. That's <laughs> the alternate title. So this was mostly because you are a Keanu Reeves fan. A uh, big Keanu Reeves fan. More yeah. than you are an action movie fan. Yes. And this did come out in a pretty like interesting time in Keanu Reeves, because he's had... I would say a couple of resurgences because mm-hmm. he was, of course, the uh, the romantic lead that you know when you were watching. But I knew him kind of when he was, I don't know, he was comedic. He was action. He was kind of everything through the 90s when I had watched a lot of his stuff. Like well, younger. His, yeah. his Bill and Ted, his, he was in Dracula. That was, he wasn't great in that. Huh. Speed, of course. My Own Private Idaho was a good one. Point Break, I really like. It's a fun movie. And then he had, I guess it wasn't that long that he was gone away. But after Speed, he didn't have a big movie again for, it felt like a long time, but The Matrix wasn't actually that long Wasn't afterward. that like 1999 or 99 something? 99 was yeah. Matrix. And then he's like back, he's at the forefront. And we'd seen a bunch of good stuff with him, but The Matrix movies were the big ones. And he got some other kind of action-y big movies like your Constantine and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And then we had some movies of his that were not as well received. Your 47 Ronin, your Man of Tai Chi, where he's doing action-y stuff, but it's not going over nearly as well as the Matrix movies. Mm -hmm. And then John Wick comes out in 2014 and he is back. He's at the top again. So Mm -hmm. he's kind of had these three... Big, almost yeah. careers within his one career. Yeah. So The Matrix was when I really first started like loving Keanu Reeves. And then uh, he did a few romantic comedies after The Matrix. Right. So I guess that's why you have yeah. that kind of idea yeah. of Keanu. Like I remember having like huge crush on him in Something's Gotta Give. 
Right, which we did which cover, we did on, cover this. on this movie. No, I did not like that movie, but go listen to that episode. I think I realized I just liked looking at Keanu Reeves in that movie because he's like cheerful and happy, which is a side that you don't get of him in The Matrix. He's, sure, yeah. He's very like stony and like serious. And but that's also just kind of Keanu. Yeah, that is something that he does in a lot of movies. And I feel like every time we uh, talk about his performances, I have to preface everything with, I love Keanu Reeves. <laughs> he is a great human. Yes. He is a great movie star. Yes. I don't think he's a particularly good actor, but I think he is good at finding roles that suit what he does, which tends to be that kind of blank slate kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, I agree. Like when you put him in a Matrix, he's good at that because this is a character who um, kind of doesn't have a past or he realizes past is not. Real, real yeah. and all of that. And in action movies, you kind of want that blank slate because you're like, that could be me. Mm -hmm. This is a, a video game and you are putting yourself into this role. Right. It's not watching Keanu do all these cool stuff. Or it is watching him do all the cool things, but it's not his personality always no. that is the draw. And I think that is the case in this one. Mm -hmm. So your first watch of John Wick, what'd you think? I thought it was a very cool movie. Um, I think it kind of complements the Matrix characters that he does, or character, I guess. Um, and I think that it's like kind of a classic Keanu Reeves movie. Yeah. In that like in that blank stony, slate action. solid, yeah, mm -hmm. blank state kind of look. I enjoyed it. I think it's a little one level for what it is. Um, but I think it did a good choice in not like doing a bunch of backstory and really like immersing you in who he was um, other than, yeah, he had a wife, he quit being a hitman and his wife died and that's where he is. And they do that really, really quickly. And um, I kind of liked that because I didn't, it wasn't a huge, big emotional arc. It was more uh, action-y and just kind of one, one level. And also, if this is your first episode, I'm the resident pretentious one. I'm the <laughs> one that brings all the art house movies and yeah. talks about German expressionism all the time. And I do want to say that I think that action movies are often much maligned as not having artistic merit or value. And I don't think that's the case. No. I think there are some of those like art house movies that are experiments in style. And then those are like, oh, that's cool and pretentious mm -hmm. and artistically valuable. But an action movie is like, oh, that's just a popcorn movie. And I think they're doing very similar things a lot of the time, especially a movie like this. Actually, last episode, I talked about how the style of an action movie can, can be enough. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the case here. Just like with some of those really old horror movies I talk about, it doesn't have the best script, it doesn't have the best performance, but like Nosferatu is important because of all of the artistic choices. Mm -hmm. And I I'm not going to say John Wick is Nosferatu, but there are a lot of artistic choices in this movie that I think are just as valuable. And it makes me forgive that like, yeah, the script's not great. Yeah. But it doesn't need to be because that's not what this movie's about. Yeah, the performances aren't great, but they don't need to be because that's not what it's about. Yeah. Or I should say they're not great in their delivering of dialogue mm -hmm. or emotions. Yeah. But they are great, Keanu especially, in his action work. Yes. And like the choreography in this movie was beautiful. And that's what this movie is. Just like we wouldn't judge dance movies and musicals on the same terms as right. a uh, like Oscar Beatty drama. Right. I feel the same can be done with action movies. And I think this is a good example of a movie that knows what it does well, mm -hmm. does those things very well. And rather than doing other things poorly, it just doesn't bother with them. No, it's not trying too hard in one way or the other. And I wish more movies would learn from this. Like, if you're going to make an action movie, make an action movie. Mm -hmm. Don't try to do everything half-assed. Do a couple things full-assed. <laughs> Go full-assed. this movie is a full-assed action movie. Yes. <laughs> and it's not a half-assed character development thing. Like, we get little things of like, hey, here's his motivation. You got it? Good. We're mm -hmm. moving on. We're probably not going to talk about it again for another hour. And we don't need to. No. So I think it is good for what it is. Yeah. 
I don't think I love what it is, oh. but I appreciate it what it is, mm-hmm. and I like what it is. I appreciate that they didn't try and like shoehorn a like love story into this or some sort of like extra piece of plot um like him trying to be a normal guy in his neighborhood or so like something bland like that i i like that yeah it is what it is and he goes around and he shoots people and he fights people and that's kind of enough for the script yeah and those elements that you're talking about that aren't in the movie they're just alluded to Mm -hmm. we get to know that he went through all of that Mm -hmm. but that's not the movie yeah So the whole backstory of him trying to get out of the mob for the love of this woman, Mm -hmm. that could be the movie. Yeah. That actually probably could be a, a, that could be an entire movie of someone who's falling in love and then has to do this big, crazy job to get out of, Mm -hmm. out of the, the, his life of crime. That's many movies. I've seen that movie many times, Mm -hmm. but I haven't seen the movie that takes place many years later. Actually, I have seen that movie too, but I haven't seen the movie that takes place many (laughs) years later after the love interest dies. And this man had one thing in his life to keep him going. Mm -hmm. And that was the love of his, I assume they get married, right? There was a wedding thing. He's, yeah, they're... I'll say wife. They say wife. They say wife. Okay. Yeah. Um, His love for his wife is his one thing, and now he doesn't have that one thing. Mm -hmm. So this makes it kind of like a a postmodern action movie. We've seen those other stories. The one last job story has been done many times. We've even gotten the seeing that guy years later. That kind of was a, a trope in the 90s a little bit more. But now we are seeing kind of this new level of post-modernity where you're like, what if that one thing, we're like four movies into mm-hmm. a action series at this point, but we're just picking it up there. Yeah. And it's just, it's it's very simple. Mm-hmm. It's just his wife has died. Now we have the puppy that is a symbol of all his of the wife. goodness yeah. of, of his wife. And now he has one new thing. That he's going to try to latch on to and make that his life. But when that's taken away from him, he doesn't have his wife. He doesn't have the puppy. So he goes back to what he knew at the beginning. And that's killing people. Yeah. And one thing that I liked about that was that's where the twists came in. Because you don't quite know like whose side he's on or whose side he was on, I guess. Right. And you don't know that. Yeah. He was just kind of like a hired contract guy and he would work for anybody, but he was so well known that everyone knows who he is and everyone knows how like good he is at his job. And so I liked that the twist at the beginning of the movie or like closer to uh, like just kind of learning about who John Wick is, is that you don't know where his allegiances lie because he has none yeah and we were saying that there is kind of just one level to this movie Mm -hmm. and i don't know if that's entirely true because i think every movie well almost every movie is pretty multifaceted but here you might have to work a little bit harder but i think that idea of whether this was a bad man who was reformed by love Mm -hmm. or if this was a good man who just fell into these circumstances because of his particular skill set. He just happened to be good at killing people. Or what the difference of that is. That is an interesting thing. Mm -hmm. And it does go throughout this movie. Maybe we don't put it on the script as much because it's never directly addressed. We don't talk about it. But I think that is a conversation to be had Mm -hmm. about this movie. Because we are, of course, on John Wick's side. Yes, yeah. And... There are times, though, when he, like, killed someone in one of the clubs. It's like, what did that guy do? Yeah. And then you remember that he is a hitman for hire. Yeah. That was his life. Yeah. And we are willing to forgive all of that because he gave it up. Right. But he still did all of those things and did not pay any sort of price for Mm -hmm. it. Rather, he lives a life of luxury because of all of that. Yes. So every now and then you have to think about, like, oh, wait a minute. And there is that kind of moral ambiguity, which maybe the movie does not tackle. But I think it is kind of built in that we have to wonder if his emotional distress at the loss of his wife and his dog are some sort of cosmic retribution for the life he has lived. Is Mm -hmm. he paying for his sins in some way? Yeah. One thing I thought about 
pretty early on in the movie when you find out that, yeah, he's had this past and he's probably killed a lot of people. One thing that I realized really quickly was that he's killed a lot of people. I think he kills seven. I, you can look it up online, but let's mm-hmm. say it's 72. I think he kills 72 people in this movie. In this movie. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah, I was going to say when... um the son of the mobster and his like goons break into his house there's like seven bodies in that house so i'm thinking like okay so he did that really easily he did not pause while doing that so like you can just think about the amount of bodies that he racked up in his previous life and so i'm then that kind of made me think about like who is this guy and i really had a good think about it um and yeah, I I thought that was kind of a fun thing that the movie did without being really heavy handed with it. And who is this guy? I think he's a contract killer with maybe a bigger conscience than you'd expect. <laughs> I, I don't want them to do a prequel for this world, but I'd they are looking at like oh, are they? part um, six or they're doing a spinoffs of it now. Oh, okay. Because, like, John Wick 4 just came out. 4 came out, and there's two spinoffs. In the works? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, One from a character from one of the other movies, not from this movie, and one about the hotel. Oh, you see, the hotel, which was something that I wanted to talk about. Anyway, I found that really interesting. Yeah, there is little bits of world building in this that you realize oh this isn't our world Mm -hmm. it's close to it and on the surface it is like our world but this is positing that the crime element of our world has this big elaborate system that works on gold tokens or something dark underbelly yeah which i yeah i think that that is an extra little level that makes it fun and it's Mm -hmm. a good way to explain away a lot of it because if you're doing this style of action movie in a completely realistic world, you're like, hey, well, what about the cops? Right. Like, how does that work? How is he just going and finding all of these doctors to fix him up? But here they have built a world where all of this can be easily explained away. Like, yeah. when the cop comes to his door and he says, like, oh, hey, good night, Jimmy. And they, yeah. they know what it's, what's going on. Yeah. Then we're like, okay, so now I don't have to explain away why are, there are no police anywhere else. Yeah, and why nobody really cares that he's, like, setting off multiple rounds of ammunition inside his house. Right. In a neighborhood. Yeah. <laughs> we assume he has neighbors. Well, he, they called. Yeah. And then that the introduction of the token system and the hotel, then you can just do whatever and we don't question it because mm-hmm. this is a different world and they tell you so little, which I think might frustrate some people, but yeah. I really enjoyed because we don't need to know all of no. that. This movie is all about, yeah, you don't need to know. Don't worry about it. Right. There's a lot of, don't worry about it. Look at this. Yeah. That is the theme of this movie. And sometimes that can be annoying or just make you aware of how shoddy the script is. <laughs> but when your action sequences are as good as this, I agree. Like, yeah, don't worry about that. Look at this cool thing that's happening. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and just a little, they did a really good job of, again, not being super heavy handed with learning the rules of this world. You get little blips of like no business on company, on like hotel property. Um, Like you better order a drink and look like you're here having fun if you are going to force me to talk about business. And like, then we know like, oh, you're not supposed to do any killing on the hotel like on the hotel property so you know that miss perkins is doing under the table like dirty work basically you could tell she was shady right at the beginning yeah well he should have killed her oh 100 percent. it's a bit of a double standard that a lot of movies have that they will kill people willy-nilly who haven't done anything bad but then when it is an attractive female they're Mm -hmm. like oh you can't kill her yeah he she should have been killed because she was an actual evil person exactly she was literally trying to kill him in a place that's supposed to be like a safe zone she's breaking all the rules yeah i love the idea that there is like also like an assassin safe zone that's fun yeah this world is interesting and you Mm want to see more and i kind of get why i got those sequels yeah yeah i'd i'd be interested to hear about how the hotel runs well there's gonna be a whole movie all about it good I also want to know about this coin system. I want to know more about it. Yeah. Because, like, I get it. Like, maybe these jobs are, like, 
putting money into accounts that like would be tracked by the government. And but this- it seems like the coins can't be the only payment. There must be actual cash. I guess. Because if it's just one coin per favor, right? Do you get one coin when you kill someone? Because he just says like, hey, here's a coin for like helping me out. Yeah. So I think the coin must be more symbolic than actual monetary value oh maybe i feel like it that just shows that you have currency in this world yes and that you're like a productive member of this society yeah. i guess yeah like you've paid your dues you yeah. have the coins to yeah. show i have like these many and so i can buy this yes okay. that's what i think okay yeah yeah because they give him coins at the hotel too for miss perkins killing him or trying to kill him i guess oh right for the with the car yeah. Because he got a car. I didn't see that yeah. he got a coin as well. It was like a roll. It was like a little roll of coins that he oh. pushes across the desk, I think. You can tell me if I'm wrong. I I just assumed that that's what it was. But yeah, there were coins going back yeah. and forth. Like when he says, oh, can you keep her here for a while? Um, catch he, and release. Yeah. He gives, her, gives him a coin. Yeah. That kind of thing. Yeah, it's just a good little thing that is shorthand that can cover a lot of script things that mm-hmm. we don't need to get into now because like oh yeah it's some magic coin system whatever yeah and you just move on yeah but it also kind of gives you a little bit of intrigue and insight into this world and i think i think that's what you could say about that this movie that it's not necessarily the most innovative action movie mm-hmm. but it's all about style and efficiency and i mean that in in every respect. This is definitely a style over substance movie. And that's that's fine. Some movies are. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. But it's so efficient in, in its world building. Like mm-hmm. you were talking about. We just explain away why yep. there's no police. We can explain away why a doctor can fix them up whenever. Mm-hmm. And the style being that it is almost monochromatic when he's outside of the criminal world everything's desaturated and then when he gets there it's neon red and blue Mm -hmm. almost exclusively and dark everyone's wearing cool black suits it's it's very stylized in that Mm -hmm. way yet it's not especially stylized in its fight sequences like people aren't doing things that can't be done yeah it's a little bit more because it is an action movie yeah. everyone is the best that they could be yeah but no one is like floating in the air no, no one has super no one's magic yeah and even in regular action movies people are jumping a little too high they're like punching people and they go flying that's not happening here no it's very real to life it's pretty grounded in that way but in some ways it's not and i love what they chose to ground in reality mm-hmm. But when I was talking about how it's uh, efficient, like the fight sequences, when they come into his house, for instance, that sequence is one of my favorites. And it's at the beginning, close to the beginning, not the one where they kill the dog, but when they come to get him and he mm-hmm. shoots, I think it's like 12 people or something yeah. in the house. He's just hitting someone once, shooting them in the belly and then finishing them off and shooting them in the head. Yeah. And it's so quick and efficient. Yeah. And it's not about look at these elaborate ways I can kill people, yeah. which a lot of action movies are into. And that's that's fine. And that's fun, too. This is about how efficiently he can kill multiple people. Mm-hmm. And it's a different kind of, of action that mm-hmm. we usually get. And it's one that I think is very well done. I know I often, when we were talking about RRR, I would talk about how I love the action sequences because... They combined this fantastic element with a certain bit of realism, like something like Ninja Assassin. And I realize I always talk about Ninja Assassin, <laughs> and nobody's seen Ninja Assassin. <laughs> and I was looking up the director of this, who was a stunt choreographer for a lot of things, including Ninja Assassin. <laughs> so that's why when I was looking at this, it's like, oh, this has that fight style that I like, where I, of course, can't fight at this level, but this looks like something that humans could do to Mm -hmm. me. And it looks like the peak performance of what humans could do. Right. So that is instantly interesting to me. Mm -hmm. Rather than having superhero fight sequences where nothing seems to matter, this is grounded enough that it makes me feel like this could happen and everything has consequence, but it's so well done that it still impresses me. Mm-hmm. And it's not just the choreography. The choreography is fantastic. Oh, it's beautiful. But it lives in a long take, right? Mm-hmm. It's not cut, 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 shaky cam, so you can't actually see that what's was, happening. Yeah, that was one thing I really appreciated. And action movies before this, for the last 
20 years, really, because I think our biggest action franchise before this was maybe those uh, Bourne movies. Right. That was a big franchise. Yeah. And it was a similar sort of idea. And it's so shaky that I hated the action sequences in those mm. movies. And this does the opposite. And it shows you that we've done the work to get this done well. We're not going to hide it from editing. We're, gonna, we're going to show you everything we have trained so hard to do. And we're going to put it on screen mm -hmm. for you to watch and enjoy. Just like with the dance movies we saw, I would always complain when they would cut away. Like, mm -hmm. Just showcase show me the dancing. What show me you the are dancing. here to showcase. Yeah. And this is to showcase action sequences. And I think it does it very well because it lets those things linger. It's not all close ups and it's not cutting away from everything. It's right. showing you everything happening and sometimes many things in one take, which just immerses you in the reality of it. Yeah. I really appreciated that um, it didn't have like the Marvel style of editing where it's all really flashy and loud constantly yeah. and that's how you know that like something exciting is happening because you only see like half a second of everything and you see everybody in half a second little like chunks this yeah this felt like you could really uh like focus on the scenes and really see what was happening and yeah really appreciate their training and the like specialization of these hitmen oh man maybe we should do hard boiled next we were talking about like what kind of movie we should do next as a, I wasn't uh -huh. sure if I was going to do Keanu or what, but maybe we should do something that's an influence on this movie. Okay. And some of my favorite uh, John Woo movies like Hard Boiled and The Killer are mm -hmm. definitely influential on this movie. That 90s Hong Kong aesthetic, you can see a lot of that in this. I think there's a lot of noir, mm -hmm. a lot of the... Uh, 40 style film noir in the lighting and the cinematography and then in those themes of uh, vengeance and loyalty and all of that kind of stuff. And I think there's a lot of Westerns in this oh. as well. Like uh, maybe not in the visuals as much, but thematically your man with a mysterious past who's on a mission to do to get the bad guy. There's mm -hmm. this one bad guy who's done something very wrong to him. Usually it is killing a loved one and then he's out for revenge right. and he kills anyone in his way. So I think all of those would be uh, pretty good <laughs> counterpoints to this as well. Yeah, and I I guess you did a better job of like summarizing those things that I really enjoyed about the movie. Like which ones? Um just you can see and maybe this is like a, an award to Keanu Reeves for his acting, was that you could see how conflicted he was and almost like, fine, I'll like go back and do this and like defend myself. Like, because you can tell that he doesn't really want to go back and be a hitman at the beginning of the movie. And then when he hits his stride, you can see why he was such a sought after legendary figure. And I liked that. Um, that he has that kind of little arc of emotion. And I think the way you put it is a good counter argument to people who say Keanu Reeves just isn't a good actor. Yeah. I think there are levels of what people are good at. Mm -hmm. And I think we got to see the good and the bad yeah. in this movie from Keanu because he has some scenes where he is talking with uh, like that an early scene with Willem Dafoe. The dialogue seemed rough to me. It did not yeah. seem good. It seemed like they were both in a movie of a different language and were mm -hmm. kind of dubbed over. Yeah. It, I like honestly didn't even really pay attention to that dialogue. And I think I you don't shouldn't. think I could quote you any of it. No. And again, that's not what this movie is no. doing. But in me defending and simultaneously <laughs> Talking about how he's not great, but yeah. Keanu, that's not his strong suit. No. Like in Dracula, he's he's the one writing the letters and everything, and oh. he's it's it's rough. He's oh. not good at that. But what he is good at is conveying these emotions more physically right. than most people would. He's not the best at a lot of dialogue things. He has good movies where he does that a little better. But mm -hmm. in this movie, I would not say any scene where he is speaking more than a couple of yeah, sentences. Yeah, he's good at a tagline. Yeah. He's good at like a quick little throwaway line. But yeah, deep conversation is not what and, he's there for. And I feel like this makes me sound like I'm saying like, oh, he's good, but just in a dumb way. Mm -hmm. That's not what I mean. I think he's good, but not in a way that is classically recognized mm -hmm. 
because I think it is a, a very specific skill set to jump into that action world and not just be someone who is doing the steps. Mm-hmm. But I can see emotion in him and conflict in him while he is doing action sequences. Mm-hmm. And I don't think that's just imagined by the themes of the movie. I think, like you were saying, you felt you saw uh, conflict in him mm-hmm. while he was killing people or doing those kinds of things, yeah. right? It was I, subtle. Yeah, but I think he can do that. Yeah. But not necessarily when he's talking a lot. No. And I think that he just finds movies that work with his skill set. Mm-hmm. I think The Matrix is that, and I think this is that as well. Yeah, and I think working with the, were they the stunt directors or people he'd worked with on The Matrix? Yes. I um, think this was his stunt double, actually, who was directing this, but then okay. also did choreography for other movies that were probably also piano ones as well. Okay, so like I think that, he was very right to bring them into when he was like negotiating his contract because they know what he does well. And I think this director, whose name I've already forgotten, but I'm (laughs) sure you'll tell me by the time I'm done this thought, he made some very smart choices in, in all these things we're talking about, how it's efficient, it doesn't waste time on certain things. First time directors don't often look this confident, Mm -hmm. but I think that comes through because He is doing things that are mostly around the stunt world. Yeah. And the rest of the things are just like, this would be cool. Mm -hmm. This movie, if I have a a harsh criticism, (laughs) it's like it tries to be real cool. Real cool. Yeah, I can see that. It's trying very hard to go for a certain aesthetic. And I think it achieves it. But sometimes like the music too, it's like... Yeah, we're we're an action movie, but we're like a, a gritty, but also still super smooth. <laughs> yeah, but very American. Yeah, so we're gonna have muscle cars. Yeah, we're gonna have hard driving guitar riffs, and we're gonna have <laughs> distorted vocals, and like that's the level of cool. Yeah. Uh, the director's name is Chad Stileski. Stileski, right? Yeah, but yeah, like I I think they played to his strengths and um didn't make him do some of the things that can make him seem kind of awkward or like unpolished like those few dialogue scenes we had <laughs> which i think were not great but they were so few and far between that you're like, okay i've forgotten yeah, about it already you gotta have some dialogue it, it's still like a two-hour story what were some of your favorite parts of the movie I assume it would be an action sequence, but anything that you really like, Trevor. <laughs> the puppy. Of course. Yeah, that puppy was so cute. And the dog in the end, you don't really get a good look at him. So I, I'm assuming he's very cute. Um, but yeah, that puppy was like super cute. And a couple of the little like glances of Keanu interacting with the puppy and trying to be this like macho guy that you know used to kill people for a living but also having this puppy and like kind of resisting its love at the beginning of like okay fine get up here like get on the bed (laughs) we'll sleep um that's one of my favorite parts and since we've given this movie very little credit for any sort of a thematic development that's that's a good one right Mm -hmm. because It was these moments of vulnerability that kind of pulled him away from his life of crime with his wife Mm -hmm. first and now with the puppy. So it was something that was trying to keep him out of it. And you can see when that is gone, he reverts back to what he used to know. Yeah. And I appreciated how well his wife knew him. Right. Like he needed something in the real world to like keep him on that like path that he had been on with her. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so that was that was pretty touching. I don't know. I enjoyed how uh, easy he slipped back into that world. Like with the ease, he wasn't unsure. He just like has this confidence to him. What about you? What are your favorite kind of moments? I think the first all out action sequence when after the dog has died and he's communicated with the the big boss in some way Mm -hmm. and he's at his house and then the team comes in to to kill him Mm -hmm. that sequence because that was kind of the introduction to how the fights are going to look in this movie right and how efficient and how many times he just shot guys in the head yeah because that's something that usually if it happens in a movie that is a a big moment right and here it's just bang 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 it's just 
He's just blowing brains out all over the place. He's so efficient. Yeah, and that's the thing. It's so efficient, and there's not a lot of wasted movement. It's not, look at all these cool things we're doing for the camera Mm -hmm. and to show that we are good fighters. It's, look how efficiently I can get rid of all of these guys, and that's showing how good I am. Right. I thought that one was was one of my favorites although the later ones are of course more impressive maybe it's because that was the the first big one that one had the biggest impact on me and then later there's that sequence where he is driving his car and shooting people Mm -hmm. and that was kind of interesting because you see car chases and you see gunfights and this was a different kind of combination because he was driving around pedestrians and shooting at them Mm -hmm. and there's that one time where he hit a guy with his car The guy flips up over his car and he shoots his gun through the roof of his car, shooting the guy as he goes by. Yeah. Like, that's a fun bit. That is fun. Yeah. I like that one. The creativity in some of the kills without it being like an over the top kind of thing. Yeah. Because that that was was the only one that was a bit silly, but it still felt like it fit in with everything else. Yeah. I was impressed with, yeah, how they kept it from being like campy or silly. Yeah. But still creative. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Still kind of anchored to reality. Mm -hmm. And then there were a lot of actors that showed up that I really like. And I was like, oh, wait, he's in this? (laughs) Like John Leguizamo was in there, who's, for whatever reason, for better or worse, I've been a very big fan of since a very young age. Uh, Dean Winters, of course, who I like a lot. Willem Dafoe, but I don't know. I didn't think this was uh, Dafoe's best work. He was a little odd in this one too. Yeah, me. I felt like I needed more from him and also less. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that's an odd way to put it, but that's kind of how I felt about it. Uh, Ian McShane had a bit in there. I like him a lot. And Lance Reddick, um, R.I.P. Lance Reddick, who oh. was at the um, the desk. Yes, yeah. I like him a lot. He's been in a lot of good stuff. He didn't really do too much in this movie, but I still like him. I enjoyed Elfie Allen as well. Who's that? Uh, he played the son. Oh, from Game of Thrones? From Game of Thrones, right. yeah. Uh, he's just a, a hateable guy. Yeah. In everything he's in, you're like, oh, I'm going to hate yeah, this, this guy. this dude sucks. Yeah. <laughs> you know what else I liked is when his death scene. Yeah. Do you remember it? Mm-hmm. It was just, bang, you're done. Yeah. No big, like, this is for killing my dog, what you took from me. Yeah. I he just walks up. Yeah. The I'm- guy... I think start saying like you don't know who I am or something like that. Mm-hmm. He starts the conversation, but Keanu just shoots him yeah. in the head. Yeah, I he's that got was a well job done. to do. Yeah, I kind of wish the uh, big boss could have taken a little bit from that because I thought that's when it kind of got into typical action movie yeah, stuff. Yeah, there was like a little bit too much acting in that scene. Yeah, of them fighting. But I guess... Oh, yeah. And then at the end, they do the bit of like, throw your gun away. Let's fight like men. Yeah, that was weird. That's that's a movie thing. And this movie was trying to stay away from those as much as possible, mm-hmm. I thought. And then it was very much that. But then, like in all the other movies, the bad guy pulls out a knife. And then the good guy's allowed to use the knife because the bad guy pulled it out in the first place. Like, right. That I've seen many, many times. And it was a, a little too derivative for how fresh everything else in this movie was yeah i agree with you that final scene was just a little too done yeah yeah but you know what wasn't done he reloads his guns yes i would for a while i was actually trying to count and i was like okay i don't think they actually pay attention to how many no but they show it but he is reloading he takes a pause because yeah that's the thing it's like in action movies where they don't watch out for that it's like he shoots off like a hundred rounds with like a handgun and never reloads yeah here it seems to be sometimes it's 10 sometimes it's 14 but whatever maybe those guns have extended clips i don't know about guns so i'll just say yeah it's fine (laughs) it's good but one thing i kind of touched on but didn't really say much about was how this seems like it's a distinctively american attempt at a like an epic Mm -hmm. an epic in the the capital e epic not just a big long movie that does a lot of things Mm -hmm. but an epic used to have uh, certain criteria that it has to be and it's like this man on the journey and everything and this kind of hits all of those beats of like your ancient greek epics right that's why they were called that and this is that it is James Bond. It is hard boiled, but it's those movies, uh, of course, are um, uh, British and Hong Kong, respectively. Right. But this is so distinctly American. Mm-hmm. Like he's 
not your cop or secret agent in his majesty's secret service. Mm -hmm. He's a criminal, but he's a criminal with a code. Yeah. And that is kind of um, something that's steeped in American yeah. culture, going back to your Westerns and everything. And, and America itself kind of prides itself on uh, being rebellious. It, the Revolutionary War was like, we're rebelling and taking things. And that's, right. violence is, of course, uh, lots of people could have, I'm sure, written this essay about how violence is ingrained in American culture because of how America became America. Right. It was violently taking it from others and then violently uh, switching over leadership from the British to being independent. Right. So it's it's rooted in violence. And of course, that comes out in so, so many different ways. But in this one, it comes out in that we can cheer for a guy who is a professional killer, a professional criminal. Yes. Because he has some sort of loyalty or code to him. Mm -hmm. And that's the case here. And then if that's not enough, it's, Rock and roll guitars. Yeah. It's Ford Mustangs, or He's I can't remember cool all the cars guy. he has, <laughs> yeah. but it's all they look very American. I'm sure every car he drives is an American car. Oh, yeah, well, yeah. usually a guy who's wearing like a slick all black suit, I would picture him in something German, for yeah. instance, but not John Wick. He's American through and through. <laughs> so after seeing this one now, do you want to watch all of the others? I do. I do. I. I'm interested to see where this goes because this very easily could have been just a standalone movie. Yeah. But I am interested to see how they build this world for sequels and how choppily it's done, I guess. Yeah. And I'm worried because big action franchises, the ones where I like the first ones, I usually stop liking them mm. quickly. Not always by part two, but by three and four I can't think of other big ones. Die Hard, of course. Right. Die Hard 1, great. 2 and 3, I'll even give you, but ooh, it, gets, it falls off a cliff it's real quickly rough. after that. Rambo as well, the first Rambo movie. Well, the first Rambo movie is not an action movie, really. Hmm. It's just a, a real, real sad movie. But action franchises, usually not good. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious about this. Will the stick with what they do and kind of keep it rooted in reality. Yeah. But then does that get redundant after a point? Yeah, that's what you... I'm interested. Because if you keep going bigger and bigger, then you just become like other action movies. Because this had a pretty solid ending. There wasn't anything that was like kind of left hanging. Right. Like they Well, didn't... you have, um. what's he going to do? Is he hitman Is he for back? hire again? Yeah. I guess that's the biggest one. I guess, yeah. Um. But yeah, I just felt like they didn't, set it up for a sequel so i'm really interested to see what they do in that sequel is it 10 years later is it immediately after this franchise would be the one that would most easily go into a prequel i would say mm -hmm, right sure. there's so many prequels he could make it could be anything he did as his career before meeting True. his wife it could be the love story of yeah. him meeting his wife and, and him trying to get out of the mob. That big last job that they talked about, like he did this impossible job. That's yeah. a movie right there. And that's how he won his freedom. Yeah, yeah, that would be. Yeah. So I'm interested to see how this goes forward uh, plot wise. I would like to watch the next ones, but I think we should watch them having fun and chatting mm -hmm. while when we watched it for the podcast we kind of sit and we watch the movie yeah relatively we, quietly yeah. sometimes we'll talk sometimes but we're watching it and we usually kind of analyze things yeah and although we did a bit of that in this probably less than we do with other movies yeah and i think these movies are just more fun if you just don't do that kind of stuff yeah i think we need to be less serious about it going yeah. forward we need to cheer and maybe like drink have a drink like every time is... he kills someone. Oh, man. Uh, I feel like this is a movie that would respond well to a drinking game. And now I have to Google drinking game. And I think Manzoukas comes into one of these movies. Does he? Yeah. Oh, that's fun. I'm not sure which one. I think three, maybe two. I'm really interested to like know what he's like in this movie. Because you don't really see him serious very often. I don't know that he will be. Oh, okay. Cool. Who knows? Cool. I'm excited. I All right. Like well, that might be the end for us. Is that I think, it? I think so. So it's a bit of a different episode, yeah. but I think we kind of got into, I, I did talk about the history of America and why movies are violent. So <laughs> I, I held up my pretentious end. Yes. Yeah. And I think I had some good points, maybe. <laughs> As always. As always. Good points, maybe. Good points, maybe. Samantha, okay. good points, maybe, Randawa. That's me. Indie 
pretentious rant dialogue. <laughs> Uh, so we'll see you next week when we find out what Indy's big watch is and we bring you two spoiler-free things of the Fortnite. Oh yeah, we've been doing themes, so usually we would announce it here, but I don't know yet. So, you know what? Just listen to the next episode. Yeah, just, it's gonna be good. Just come on back. We'll, we'll figure something out. Maybe it'll be linked to this movie. Maybe it won't. Maybe it won't. Who knows? Who knows? Why is it haunted? I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> okay, see you next week. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.